So, so yeah, we practice the, the whole thing, the hand off, whatever. Okay. Um, what I want. Okay, I'll try 15 minutes. Right. Um, so I'm Richard. I've come here from New Zealand. Um, I'm on my first trip to Europe. So thank you for having me on the exact antipodes from my house. Um, so I want to tell a brief story about where I've been, what I've seen, um, and where I think it's going, because I come from 12 hours in the future. <laughs> so um, in 2011, um, I graduated as an engineer, um, graduated into a marketplace that didn't have any engineering jobs, and through uh, necessity I discovered open source hardware engineering, which is remixing other people's hardware ideas uh, to come up with my own. Um, and that introduced me to this crazy community of hackers all around the world that were doing the same thing. And, and actually, now in reflection, I can see that it gave me um, particular expectations about how politics should work. I could see from that engineering experience of remixing and rigging and writing and, and free exchange and, and sharing uh, an idea about maybe politics could work a bit more like this. So when um, Occupy Wall Street started at the end of 2011, I could see some kind of thin thread between my experience in the open source community and with this political moment. So um, I got involved and that was my first taste of, of politics because up until that point I had just been disgusted with the operation of politics. So um, I won't install Java at this point, thank you. Um, but Occupy was, was one of those transformational moments um, and it the experience of sitting in a circle and, and participating in the, in the making of decisions, which Adam talked about yesterday, being maybe not so good at making decisions, but extremely good at build, building effective bonds between people. Um, that intensity of, of bonding, for me, shifted my identity. It, it pushed me out of um, being the single-minded mad scientist engineer into being part of a collective and having um, a, a tangible almost experience of solidarity where um, where my global colleagues and Wall Street who I shared that identity with when I saw them being physically beaten by the police I could feel this emotional sense that I hadn't ever had before like I got access to this new emotional landscape um, and and I got access to the practical experience of collective intelligence as in a group being more intelligent than any of its members. So that's inspirational when it's like changing my life and all that, but it's also super frustrating to spend all your time sitting in assemblies because they're not actually very um, time efficient. So as Occupy Collapse um, imploded, turned into the zombie apocalypse, whatever the kind <laughs> word is for it, um, my friends and I in Wellington had the sense that certainly there is something very valuable in this experience and certainly there are opportunities to innovate on the form and um, share that experience with many more people by translating it into an internet context. So um, consequently we started this thing called Lumio which is a, um, an online platform for, to communicate that experience, to, to train to um, infect people with the experience of being part of a collective intelligence. Um, and a design principle, I guess, for how we've built Lumio is uh, we attempt to always stay relevant to each new social movement that emerges. So um, when the Sunflower Movement took off in Taiwan in 2014, uh, we were thrilled to have Audrey get in touch with us. Right, so uh, in 2014, uh, what happened in Taiwan was that there was this cross strait, which means Taiwan and Be Be Beijing, uh, trade agreement deal, and the legislative body refused to deliberate it because it's a domestic affair, according to this loophole of the Taiwan Constitution. And then, so a bunch of uh, students are very angry about that, understandably, but instead of, you know, storming or, or making a riot or anything, they occupied the parliament, and there was nobody expecting there's no police, and they, they just started 
deliberating the exact the same trade deal inside the parliament as they think the legislature should have done it. And so it was obviously very uh, intense because the police is like, how do we even deal with this kind of thing? And then so uh, I, I was the, uh, there the very first night trying to broadcast out this uh, deliberation out to the, the world. And so what happened was that as soon as the police surrounded the students, that there's sufficient number of people who went to the occupied place and counter surrounded the police. And then we have the video footage to, to uh, prove that it is completely nonviolent. And so uh, after the scene stabilized because police was counter surrounded, people on the streets started seeing through our uh, live 24-7, uh, uh, three uh, viewpoint uh, live streaming that what's happening inside the, the legislation was the General Assembly, was the Occupy Wall Street uh, hand gestures, everything, and they want to be part of it too. So uh, in the three sides of the street, we started having people deliberating on the uh, topics of agriculture, about whatever that they care about. But the thing of us, of the equivalent of the Commission uh, Numeric, uh, to support these people is that we, we are privileged in the sense that we're like uh, lawyers or physicians, we're neutral, we protect everybody, so that we have this special special fast lane that gets us to places very quickly. And then because our badge itself is free of copyright, people started making their own badges and then started to say, hey, I want to help. But there are engineers who actually want to help and we don't want to be exclusive. We don't want to, to say, you know, we're just a bunch of people. So, but there is a very real problem of tourists reading <laughs> the Gossipo badge. And so we use Lumio as a, a way of gathering consensus of um, on how do we feel about this particular issue. And we start with some very interesting but not really workable like uh, exchanging your ID card for a badge that is numbered exactly like interpreting uh, equipment here but uh, it is obviously a non starter for a scalable movement and so after like five rounds of uh, straw polling which Richard will explain in a bit in, in Lumio uh, what we settled down was to we ask each person who shot with that zero badge what is two to the power of 15 and they can answer instantly we know that they're they're here to help or at least have the capacity to help back to you <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, you, you've invited me to explain briefly how Lumio actually works, so I should just touch on that because people like mm -hmm. uh, to understand things. So Lumio is a discussion platform for a group, for a group of people, um, usually, up, uh, usually in the hundreds or up to thousands, but really the smaller groups are better. Um, and any, you have a discussion and then throughout the discussion anyone can make a proposal and say, I think we should do such and such about this action, and then the group can develop that thinking together until they come up with the best idea in the room. Um, so, I was invited to meet with Audrey and the rest of the crew in Taiwan um, at, at the end of 2014, and it was my first visit um, to Asia, and I was prepared to experience some degree of cultural shock. But the shock to me was actually how familiar these people were that the cultural distance between us was actually extremely small, mm -hmm. that we have the same sensibilities, literally the same sense of humour, um, the same reference points and the same ways of behaving. Um, later on I, I got to meet with uh, Jinsun and, and, and the Waggle crew in Korea and had once again the same experience. These people that um, I'd been told were, com were foreign were actually my neighbours. They just happened to be geographically distant but um, relationally extremely, extremely close. Um, so now I'm in Europe, it's my first tour of Europe and I um, got to meet with Mr. Vu in Paris and sat down with a young man there who more or less told me exactly the same story of transformation that I told you at the start of this talk. He is an engineer, he was dissatisfied with politics and with his work options, got involved with this horizontal movement and found it to be, the radical experience for him, he said, was to spend a week just listening to people. Listen to people, unfiltered, direct. That is what shattered his perception. He had a direct access to, to real life that wasn't mediated by, by um, prophecy and corporation. Um, which was, yeah, exactly the same experience as mine. And so I'm starting to see this um, strong coherence, this, this culture that is has uh, huge solidarity, huge commonality, um, and it's, it, it, it's agnostic about location. Um, and, and what I saw in that brief conversation with Mr. Boo was that that culture is actually in the minority. 
in Paris right now. The culture being having been inherited from the open source software engineers who have practiced mass collaboration where you can just pick up your little piece, work on it, share it back, not have too much thought to the credit or anything like that, just do the thing that you're interested in and leave the rest to everyone else. That way of approaching software is, is also the way that these movements are trying to approach politics. So the software engineers have a head start on everyone else, but this culture is starting to move and, and it seems to be picking up pace. Um, and so what I've been thinking about is how does this culture move? What are the, what are the micro behaviours that you can identify it with? And um, just in the last day or two, I've started listing out some examples of this, you know. So um, I've spent all day on Twitter. I've been reporting this event on Twitter. And I'm using hashtags to, to collect this information into relevant places. Mm -hmm. And I'm using a system called Folksonomy as opposed to Taxonomy to sort the information. That is, there's a, the folk have decided what are the categories. And um, if the folk agree that it's a useful hashtag, it becomes popular. If it's the folk don't care about it, it, it goes up to the side. It doesn't die, it's not squished, but it doesn't have any relevance. Um, similarly, I'm writing on collaborative documents. So that means um, the authors on the collaborative documents have given up their authorship. They no longer own the words. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an element of ego that's been removed, and it's actually about exchanging ideas. Um, Maybe I want three at that point, I think, mm -hmm. rather than trying to make ten. Mm -hmm. um, and these um, these behaviours for me, they really are the characteristics of the future areas. And the, the challenge for, for us at Lumio and the challenge for anyone that's building technology for uh, a new form of democracy is actually not so much what's the user interface, what's the data model, um, what's the business model? The question is, what's the culture transformation model? Or the, the way that you transmit and, and transform people on the way through that process. Mm -hmm. And that means transforming individuals. Mm -hmm. So uh, yesterday we heard the mayor talking about how change is continuous consultation. And the change that I'm interested in means continuously con confronting myself. You know, like. I want to participate in a group that nourishes my best qualities and, and polishes out my worst ones. You know, so a practical example in Lumio, we've designed with our organisation is a worker-owned cooperative. So instead of being a CEO of Lumio, I'm a co-founder, and anyone that works on Lumio for a period of time, once they've demonstrated a commitment to the thing, then they become an equal. Co member. Co -op member. Mm -hmm. So we have now 11 cooperative members mm -hmm. and we share equal rights and equal responsibility. And that's a, a system design that is intentionally subverting my egotistical characteristic that wants to consume power all the time and is designing in this no, actually, I want to share power. So that's the challenge we're up for at the moment. And then I just need some gentle segue back mm -hmm. to you. Okay. So, um, we still have time, so I'll continue to rehearse. That's great, we share 25 minutes. So, um, yeah, so thanks, uh, Rich, for uh, outlining the uh, characteristics of Futurians. Uh, and Rich comes from the far future, which is 12 hours, and just to the near future, which is 6 hours <laughs> from now. Uh, so, I will share with you some more contemporary news. I will talk to you about how we solved the Uber case in Taiwan, how a uh, engineer quit his school job and become the Prime Minister of Taiwan, and what, what, what kind of changes that we have brought with this kind of hyper culture directly on the national level in, in the, uh, Taiwan. So Taiwan is six hours in the future, it's an island with 23 million people, and uh, just last Friday, uh, our new president came to office, and she's uh, excellent. I, I voted for her. And the re reason why I voted for Dr. Tsai Ing-wen is that she is a fellow animal lover. Now, I live with eight cats and two dogs, and so um, I agree with her values. Um, for example, uh, the cultural diversity of origin rights, marriage equality, uh, abolishment of capital punishment, uh, all, all sorts of things, animal welfare, even animal rights. So um, all, all these very um, close values to me uh, signifies that she, she really cares. And, and because she's not personally married or partner, our first family is literally these two cats and three Labrador dogs. <laughs> and the best thing about this arrangement is that you cannot bribe first family members, but you can with capital 
chicken and treats, but it would not change Dr. Tsai's policy for you. Um, anyway, and the transition between the election, which was back in January, until now, to four months. In the four months, there is no single part of partisan fight, even though it's a transfer of power, an enormous thing. But why? Because the outgoing premier, the prime minister, Simon Zhang, worked for Google, quit the job at Google, went back to Taiwan, and become our minister and our prime minister. And so the outgoing uh, premier, Simon, has this main contribution saying, all the public uh, government funded uh, ICT systems, as long as they're like 1 million euro or so in, in size or below, everything has to be open data by default. There's no arguing. It's just open data. And with this, Taiwan become the number one place on the Open Knowledge Foundation Global Open Data Index, just like that. And so um, the, the way Simon works is through transparency and open data. So when we learned that uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen nominated another independent, non-partisan economist to be the next prime uh, minister, the two prime ministers agree on something that never happened before in Taiwan and I believe in very few places in the world. They say they will do the transition in front of the live streaming and they will have all the ministries upload, which they did, all their trans transmission uh, reports and materials first to the internet and then to the next administration. So the entire citizenry become empowered of how the original administration thing and where the uh, new administration is going. Wow. And so, and this is the norm in Taiwan, this is not an exception. We, our uh, Taipei city mayor, uh, Dr. Cohen Zhe, was a medical professor and he has, was no politician at all, he's just another neighbor, as your mayor would say. And then, and then he, he's a medical professor who, who cares a lot about the, the people, but as a fellow citizen. And our vice president, again, a nonpartisan and independent is a research on epidemics and so on. So it, this is the norm. And, but we did actually have a, a, almost half a century of party politics. So how do we grow out of it? It's through the Occupy that I just talked about. Before that, everybody was like, oh, it's just parties. But after that, it's like, oh, the citizen has the power. <laughs> And, and we don't have to care about all these, you know, you know, the last uh, 20th century, whatever, you know, <laughs> we can just have the sunflower take, take care of the Congress. They're obviously doing a better job. So, and uh, so uh, I'm part uh, of a movement called Gap Zero. And Gap Zero, the, the Commission Numerique for the Occupy in the Sunflower, is based on this very simple idea. Our environmental agency in Taiwan is emv.gov.tw. So if you're in your browser bar, change it O to a zero, you get into this shadow government, which is the open source version of the same national data, but presented in an open source and free and visual interactive kind of way. And the idea is that this is a fork of the original government, but once the original government thinks it's a good idea, they merge it back because we all abandon our copyright. So with this way, we, have, we, we cooperate, but collaborate uh, as a, a fellow citizens, not uh, as, you know, Contractors. So why are there so many, like literally thousands, tens of thousands of hackers hacking on democracy in Taiwan? I think it's because uh, it, ours is the first generation to speak out freely. My parents' generation were still in censorship in martial law. The, the time where we get the press of freedom is in 1988 which is the year of personal computers. And the time we got our first presidential election was in 1996, which is the year of the Wild Web explosion, the social web. So for us, the internet and democracy, they're not two things, they're the same thing, evolve together, appear together. So when we work on free software, our association is on free as a freedom, not as in, you know, not having to pay for it. And we always are very careful about its social com uh, impact. So when we learn that Nudibu is using the same tool that we improve upon during the Sunflower of the Lumio, we're very happy, we're like, we're part of this continuous movement across the, the globe. And so uh, by late 2014, when we uh, arrived to Taiwan, um, we, we actually had a, a, a landscape change because all the local city governments were won by occupier, occupier friendly mayors, just like what happened here <laughs> in Spain. And so it, it created enormous pressure on the national government. So the uh, prime minister uh, had to resign and replace with the engineer prime minister, who, <laughs> who, now, who, who now says, okay, we want to, to do this open source government thing. And so their first case, which is what everybody in the past two days was talking about, was this global epidemic called Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, so we actually solved the Uber case in Taiwan, to my knowledge, the first place in, in the world to do so. Um, 
And the way we, we do this is by realizing that Uber is not a company. It's an idea. It's a virus of the mind. Uh, they call them the, themselves sharing economy, right? So when uh, the government want to do something about it, they think and maybe shut down its local office or whatever, the app just keeps sharing the, the economy. So it, it doesn't work, right? It having Paris it doesn't work. So how do we do about this? I mean, the taxi driver even surrounded the Ministry of Transport demanding a negotiation with sharing economy. But it's like a virus, a biological virus. How do you negotiate with an epidemic? It's not even the same level of things. So what we realized was that uh, there's a minister, Jacqueline Tsai, who quit his, uh, her uh, job as the head of uh, law state, uh, in IBM Asia to join the public service. And she's like, the only way we inoculate people against this kind of mind virus is to get people to start talking to each other and involve everybody. But because we don't have a national uh, debate panel or something, we have to work with the sunflower technologies to recreate this kind of public attunement to, to this issue. Because when we uh, think about something very closely, deeply together, it becomes an inoculation of the mind. We become immune to the PR campaigns anybody can, can uh, muster. So um, there's roughly speaking four steps. First is to collect all the facts. And then to ask each other what are our feelings to those facts. It must be fact-based feelings. And then what are the possibilities that ideas that open out based on the feelings you can there be many rounds of this kind of thing. And finally, when we have an idea that has everybody's consensus, we just ratify it. This is standard deliberative technology. But in the old uh, governance model, it's not like that because the government keeps all the data to itself, uh, like Unified Front or whatever, and the private sector has their own interest in, their, uh, in the stream. So the people protest on the stream is actually not looking at the same facts even uh, as the, the decision makers, the policy makers. And without facts and without feelings, the ideas become something even more dangerous, the virus of bias, the ideology. Once you have ideology, you, it, the virus makes people blind to each other's feelings. It makes people blind to the new facts. So the only way we can tackle this is by having the minister, Jacqueline Tsai, sharing all the documents she receives, not just numbers, but meeting records, analysis, studies, to the public. And then asking the private sector and the citizen to do the same, so that we can deliberate on this in fact. And now we use this new tool called Pervis, which is a uh, new startup in Seattle who just open sourced this tool. It is a sentiment gathering tool uh, uh, where you can see where everybody stands and the polarized, how polarized they are. And you see that your Facebook friend or Twitter friends are actually all over the map, they're not your, your enemies. And the idea is that using machine in, uh, learning intelligence, you log in into the site, see your friend's face, and then see one of your friends uh, stating one thing about Uber. And then you can press yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree. As you press yes or no, your position starts to move among the people. But then after answering a few questions, you may want to propose your own sentiment, and this runs for many, many weeks, but in our case, for four weeks. So initially, they were very polarized because we sent the same uh, website to all the stakeholders. So the taxi fleet, the Uber fleet, the Uber X, Uber Pop, and then uh, the uh, ride sharing community, everybody wanted their, their voice being heard, and the initial grab was not pretty, it was four very uh, like a radical, uh, not even talking to each other groups. And then by, because we say, we will use the consensus of the system, but only if you manage to convince each other. We use as our consensus uh, items to deliberate with Uber and with all the representatives to make binding law. But we only use things that has global consensus as binding law. So over the week, people start to see each other's sentiments and try to propose more moderate, uh, more <coughs> um, in-depth, supported by real feelings, statements, and ideas to try to get uh, recognition from their fellow citizens. And by the fourth week, we have a set of seven consensus items that are very coherent and accepted by everybody. And the top score, one with 95% consensus, was proposed by a Mozilla uh, developer and in Taiwan who has nothing to do with the sharing economy. <laughs> but he, he's like, isn't Uber just a five-star rating system? If the uh, government can subsidize and encourage that the local co-ops develop exactly the same uh, two-way rating system and encourage their use, then we have the best of both, both worlds, and the government should totally do that. And, and actually, Uber drivers are very pro that, too. So, so everybody say yes, and that's the 95% consensus uh, of the entire Taiwan populace. So then we get everybody on the same table, and then ask them, okay, here are our seven consensus items, what do you think about it? And because we're broadcasting this live to thousands of people, and so and afterwards, when I take on my Uber flag or something, the driver will sometimes say, oh, you're the facilitator, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we managed to, to get a consensus on, on those people. 
and then just bring it to the administration to say, now this is actually accepted both by representatives in top-down fashion and actually decided by the people in a bottom-up fashion. Each of those seven was written by a citizen and then convinced fellow citizens. So just um, actually four days ago, the new administration, the first thing the new Minister of Transport did was ratify our consensus items. So now we have a new, new law. And then I will not bore you with the details, but suffice it to say, it fits the, the you know ideal solution of Uber that the speakers of yesterday did. So, <laughs> so, so after Uber and Airbnb, we also did it very successfully with Airbnb endorsing this whole method and actually finding that only one third of their, their landlords and tenants actually agree with their position. <laughs> and so we have a much more balanced uh, house sharing law also. So, um, yeah, and, and that's our story of, of resolving Uber. And after Uber, we, we turn our attention to those uh, public issues with less uh, spotlight, and we founded new media and crowdfunded uh, like with about three, uh, 300,000 euros, uh, a, a new uh, online media that's developed to investigate journalism, which is a co-op, a, a uh, non-profit, and then it has about 100,000 regular subscribers. We also make a new um, uh, TV show, um, web TV show that talks with this, uh, our new Minister of uh, Culture uh, in a bottom-up agenda-setting fashion of the crowdsourced question to, to this person. And then we have a journalist interviewing her and film it in virtual reality in 360 so that everybody can be like sitting with the minister and engage in the same kind of rapid uh, fire QA session with minister as we will do uh, at the end of this panel. So <laughs> I think that the main uh, takeaway I, I want people to bring about this is that the new technologies like virtual reality, machine learning, AI, whatever, we can use it in a way that is uh, commodifying you know, the relational labor and make us all like robots or zombies, but we can also use that as the co uh, cognitive burden to re uh, relax our cognitive burden when we want to talk to our fellow citizens on major airports, uh, on constructions, on environmental land use issues and things like that. Like this, this is the uh, today's technology, this is not a uh, far future. So basically, my point is that this kind of technology let us attune not only to the uh, emotion state of each other, but also to the animals like the clouded lover who was extinct around the time I was born. And uh, the, the first thing the sunflower movement after we won was that not that we go back to our home, we retreated from the parliament, but we went to the environmental agency and surrounded that and forced the uh, stop to a uh, road construction that would make the leopard cats. There's less than 500 of them now to stop, and uh, to because otherwise these cats would be extinct. And then we succeeded on that too. <laughs> and the, the, the roads did not get built, and so we still have leopard cats. But we must admit, though, um, it's because cats are really cute. And what, what about the other animals that are less cute? <laughs> we, we need to find a way. And, and uh, like in Disneyland Par Paris, we are, have this VR rides for five, five minutes. You become like in the Ratatouille, you are running a rat, and then you see the whole Paris city in a software defined Paris city. And you, you get to see the rats angle on the city. And that is where, where we're working from. So, and, and a lot of this technology, of course, initially are designed for gaming, right? But it, it's, it's not a, a problem because as long as it's free, we can always repurpose it and change it into games with a purpose. And that's what I'd like you to think, democracy. It's, it's a game with a purpose that we all play. And then the, the entry level of the game is maybe just voting, which is just one bit of information. It's just like clicking like on social media. I mean, it's, it's a start, but it's the, just the entry level of democracy. The next level is going to be open data, where you can share your budgets, laws, and any items like you do in Madrid, and then have this uh, collective big picture link data on it. And the third level is going to be a real foreign system like Lumio, where people can ask questions and uh, talk among themselves, but also get real-time response from the, the public servants and the pro private sector. Everybody can just have a, a meaningful uh, discussion on it. And with what Lumio does, in addition of being a forum, was that uh, it lets us to, to uh, watch each, uh, each other's feelings and say yes or no or got the sentiment on it. And with this kind of tool, we can then carry this back to the face-to-face -face sitting and use that as an agenda to do real deliberation, like binding deliberation. And when we do that, something magical happens in, in that people become united, people become uh, very attuned to each other. Even the taxi drivers and Uber drivers realize if they agree on a consensus item that one driver can join multiple fleets and their cars don't need to be painted yellow and they need not to be a medallion, then they are actually solidarity, uh, which is, by the way, part of the law in Taiwan now. So, <laughs> right. so the final level, I would argue, of democracy is the true agenda setting power. The special thing about this is that it never comes from above. 
no government can give us this power. This power grows when we are ready to take over um, the agenda setting power. It, it can only emerge naturally. So uh, with true agenda setting power, what it means that we change the rule of the game itself from that one of a limited game, thin the game where you can win or lose of scarcity into the abundance. And that won't happen until uh, we get the, the first few levels right. So with just one minute left, <laughs> uh, counting on this picture. Nowadays, uh, it's very easy to uh, use social technologies as a filter bubble and only talk with people. Uh, just one more minute. <laughs> uh, one minute. Yeah. Just wait, yeah, just one, one minute. minute. We're on Spanish time. Relax. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll rehearse um, when we're walking because I only have one minute.